so much for tuning in to this episode of Remnant Radio. We've got an exciting episode. We're talking about the Ten Commandments. I've got Dr. Peter Lightheart on the other side of this call. Before we jump into the discussion, we're going to be talking about the Ten Commandments. I really want you to be engaged as we're going forward with that. But I want to let you know a little bit about our ministry if you've never tuned in before. Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. We uh, live stream every Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, but this week we're all over the place. We've got four episodes and one that four we're editing. Episodes, yeah, it's it's <laughs> been nuts. Uh, but the goal of the show is to interview pastors and teachers from different churches, different denominations, kind of get outside of our theological echo chamber. Uh, ask people to to teach us uh, the word, their position on given theological subjects. We kind of suspend our presuppositions momentarily so that we can learn from people on the other side of the aisle, if you will. Uh, and today is going to be a great episode. Looking forward to it. Before. We dive in too much to the subject, Michael. Well, let people, been, man? I'm good. I'm good. And I want to let people know <laughs> just kind of what to expect. Uh, literally today, we have two more episodes. That's today. right. Today, this yeah. this one popped up literally today. Doctor Sam Storms is going to be with us. He has a new book coming out about just kind of everything gifts of the Holy Spirit. He's going to be talking about that at six o'clock live and. After Sam Storms, uh, we have, who do we have, Josh? Ah, Dr. Ben Witherington. That's right. The third. Okay, you got to put the third Not on there. Not confused with the, the second. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, he's going to be talking about Arminianism. So I know how much you guys love to talk about soteriology. <laughs> we had a Calvinist on a few weeks ago. We have a debate coming up That's next right. week between a Calvinist and and a provisionist. Okay, so we've got all kinds of yeah, in conversation. Just this week, we were able to book Jeff Durbin from Apologia Radio and interview Todd White. <laughs> that doesn't, nobody does that. Shows don't do that kind of stuff. So make sure quite a, to subscribe. Across the spectrum there. Uh, so We digress no further. Dr. Lightheart, tell us a little about yourself and your ministry before we, uh, we, before we dive into the subject. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It's yeah. uh, I'm looking forward to this a lot. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm uh, Peter Lightheart. I'm in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. I've been a, a pastor of two different churches in the past. I've taught theology at uh, a Christian college for 15 years out in Idaho. I'm currently president of the Theopolis Institute here in Birmingham. Uh, the Theopolis Institute is a uh, study center think tank. Uh, it's also in, in some fundamental ways, we, we think of it as a community of scholars and teachers that are devoted to a deeper understanding of scripture, a deeper understanding of liturgy and worship, and particularly in the light of scripture. Uh, and then uh, we think that a, uh, a church that worships faithfully and biblically uh, is a church that's culturally transforming. So uh, there's a, our, our triad of topics is a, a broad one, but it's Bible liturgy and culture. And we see those things all integrated together. Uh, the liturgy has to be a biblical liturgy in order to be pleasing to God. And a vibrant biblical liturgy is one that forms a church that's going to be culturally transformative. We hold classes. We're going to hold a class uh, in uh, Dallas coming up in the first weekend of uh, November. So uh, you all are not far away. Um, so I'm, uh, you can get on our website, theopolisinstitute.com, and find the schedule of events. Okay, praise God. That's wonderful. And Dr. Lightheart, could you tell us a little bit? I know I read, uh, I read your book on the Ten Commandments, and guys, you, I mean, we're going to be talking about it today, and you're going to hear some about it. I think it's going to whet your appetite. But you definitely, you need to buy this book. I mean, it is, uh, it was really a, a amazing and a depth of meditation on the Ten Commandments, and it was just really beautiful. Uh, w could you tell us about any any other books or any other way that we can connect with you? Yeah, I, I I write in several different areas. I've, I've been I've done a number of biblical commentaries. Uh, most recently, a two volume commentary on Revelation that came out in 2018. Um, I also do some work in in literature. I've got a years ago I wrote a study guide for Shakespeare plays, and I've got another study guide coming out uh, later this year on a, another another set of Shakespeare plays. And then one of the Art Theopolis projects is to introduce Theopolis um, through a series of books that we're calling the Theopolis Fundamentals. These are uh, fairly brief books that cover some of our main uh, topics. Um, we have one on liturgy, the Theopolitics and liturgy, one on uh, scripture hermeneutics, 
uh, Theopolitan Reading. I'm currently working on one on culture, which is going to be called Theopolitan Mission. So uh, that would, uh, this is the, some of the things I've been working on most recently, and you can, uh, uh, they're on Amazon, but that would give uh, your audience a, a sense of what uh, Theopolis is about, as well as a uh, an introduction to things that I, I write on. Praise God. Excellent. Well, you know, we have, uh, we've been doing stuff on Ten Commandments. We had uh, Carmen, Carmen Imes come on the show, and we, we discussed bearing God's name in light of the Ten Commandments. I know there's different views. Uh, many of our audience who have been raised in Sunday school would be aware of the Ten Commandments. Can you give us a kind of a springboard into your kind of your hermeneutical approach to the Ten Commandments? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I was uh, um, found myself somewhat dissatisfied with some of the frameworks that are used for discussing the Ten Commandments, and so I was uh, went into this project. I was commissioned by uh, Lexham Press to do the to do the book. And uh, went into the project thinking, looking for a, a way of approaching it that would be fresh. And uh, it ended up being um, uh, something that emerged out of uh, a, a grammatical point, out of an exegetical point. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments are all given to Israel. The Lord is speaking from Sinai and he's speaking to several hundred thousand people. So it's a large crowd. But each one of the Ten Commandments is phrased in the singular. Uh, in, the, in the old King James, uh, uh, Jacobean English distinguished between the singular and the plural. Uh, the singular was thou, the, the plural is you or ye. And all of the Ten Commandments we know are thou shalt not or thou shalt. And um, that uh, that's kind of a puzzling thing for God to be speaking to several hundred thousand people at the foot of Sinai and uh, talking to them as if they were one person. And so I started exploring that, and I, I, my argument was that uh, uh, the Lord is addressing Israel as uh, as His Son. That theme is established early on in the Book of Exodus, when the Lord first sends Moses to um, Pharaoh. He says, "Tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son. Let my son go." The whole kind of negotiation, or uh, that, that that Pharaoh engages in with Moses, is about uh, the freedom of the son. Uh, ultimately, the Lord uh, executes judgment against uh, Egypt, son for son. He takes Pharaoh's son because Pharaoh has taken his son. And then he brings his son Israel to Sinai, and he gives father-son instructions. So that was, a, that was a way of getting into the Ten Commandments. So they're, they're not just, certainly the Lord is the king of Israel. He's, he speaks authoritatively. But I think the setup of the Ten Commandments is really more paternal. It's father-son discussion. And then once you start thinking about that in terms of, um, in terms of the whole scripture, then uh, we know that Jesus is the true Israel. Jesus is the Son, and so the Ten Commandments are uh, a description. They're commandments to, to Israel, but they're also a description of the faithful Son, uh, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. So it gave it a, it gave it a christological framework for understanding the Ten, the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Okay, and so when you when we read the Ten Commandments, I mean, I, I hear a lot of Christians say things like, "Well, well, I mean, maybe they'll point to Romans three twenty, and the law is given to show how sinful we are, and mm-hmm. and so the the law was was simply for that, and that we just we need the gospel now. Uh, do you believe that's is that an oversimplification of what the law is for? How should a Christian relate to the Ten Commandments? Yeah. I think there, there, yeah. I think that is an oversimplification. There, there are different dimensions to it, um, and in just to, there's complexity in Paul himself, because uh, he will he will say things like that to make it sound like the law is gone, but then he'll say things like, um, "Haven't you looked at the law? Don't you know that those who offer sacrifices and work at the altar eat from the altar?" Uh, and he's citing Levitical Levitical instructions that have to do with the ceremonial law, uh, the priestly law. So he cites the law as if it were authoritative, and yet he describes the law as having passed away in some respects. So I think what uh, there's a couple of things that I, uh, that I've come to as a way of describe, uh, describing that continuity and discontinuity. Um, for Israel, the law was not just a set of commandments, but it was the whole social and political structure of Israel and liturgical structure. Uh, in in insofar as Torah is a system under which people live, we're no longer under that system. 
We don't offer animal sacrifices. We don't keep purity laws. Uh, the, the civil laws of Israel are still instructive to us, but they're not the laws that we enact in, uh, directly in modern societies. So we're no longer under the, the system of the Torah, and yet all of Scripture is instructive. And so we go to the whole Bible uh, and seek to understand what God would have us do from all of Scripture, not just from the New Testament. And I think that, again, the, the Christological dimension helps to answer that question, too, because once you start reading the Ten Words in the light of, if you think of that as uh, the Father uh, Yahweh speaking to Israel, which is also the Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, talking about his Son, then you begin to see how Jesus actually keeps all of the commandments in a perfected way. Um, so uh, in, in a, I think uh, in the full scope of things, we, as Paul says, Paul says this at the beginning of Romans 8, um, the, uh, those who uh, walk in the spirit uh, keep the righteous requirement of the law. Uh, we're no longer under condemnation, but uh, the law is fulfilled by those who walk in the spirit. Uh, those who follow Jesus are actually doing what the law always intended to be done. So I think you, you, you can you can uh, close that gap by reading the Ten Commandments Christologically. Do you think that it's a it's kind of a helpful uh, I don't say illustration but category to think of the law as uh, moral law and uh, uh, ceremonial law, and splitting of the law, law yeah. and civil law like that? Is that a helpful way to look at Scripture, or can that be distracting? Uh, yeah, like a lot of questions in theology, I'd say, yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Uh, yeah, I, I, there's, you can see kind of rough, uh, you can see rough uh, classification within the law itself. I mean, there's certain, there are certain rules that apply to the, within the sanctuary. There are certain rules that apply uh, to everyone everywhere. There are certain rules that apply in the land. Uh, the, the, those, I think land and sanctuary, I think those are the categories that you're totally talking about where the what in, in what environment does the law apply? I think that's a, that may be a better, mm -hmm. more biblically grounded way to think about it. I think that, and then right. I guess the follow-up question to that would be like, would you place, because that's the way that we always look at the Ten Commandments, is we look at them as God's moral law, but then we get yeah. really distracted by Sabbath observance. We get very distracted by some of those other ones. We're like, ah, we're, we like them as moral <laughs> law, but nine of them out of ten of them we like as moral law. Like we, So uh, that, that's why I'm asking, is it, is it a helpful yeah, way to look sure. at it? Yeah, I think... Um, I think I was going to say you can see these rough approximations, but I don't think ultimately that the law is set up that way. There are all these overlaps. Sometimes the civil law of Israel is described as if it were ceremonial law, uh, and the ceremonial law involves a lot of things that seem to have moral implications. So I don't, uh, I don't, I think it's much more complicated. They're they're intertwined. Even if you can make some rough uh, distinctions, I think all of the different dimensions of the law are intertwined. And I think uh, regardless we're called as Christians to engage with all of the law, everything in the Torah, everything in the Old Testament scriptures, and seek to understand them in the light of Christ and see how they apply to us. But I think in the Ten Commandments particularly, um, this was something that uh, occurred to me as I was working through the text for the book. Uh, I don't think it's proper to say that these are just moral law. The, the Sabbath is a good example. Uh, the Sabbath is not just about personal morality. Uh, it's addressed to heads of households, business owners. Uh, in order to really, in order to really keep the Sabbath command in its fullness, you need a whole community or whole nation keeping the Sabbath command. That's that's civil law. So it only uh, makes it's, sense as like it, if it is moral, it only makes sense in light of the national identity. It only makes sense in correct. light of the community in which that holds that law. Huh. Yeah, but, and, yeah. and what do you what is it about? I mean, because we have of the Ten Commandments, we have this one, the Sabbath, that seems to to stand out. Now, obviously, some Christian brothers would would disagree with us and say that this there is an ethical obligation to keep Sabbath. I know I, I read your book and I know that um, what I recall you saying and, or what I understood you saying was that we're not morally, ethically necessarily required to keep it. Christ fulfilled it. Colossians 2, Romans 14. At the same time, don't rush too quickly past it and say, I never need a day of rest. I'm a superhuman robot, <laughs> right? Like that there's a wisdom to spiritual rhythm. Uh, yeah. But where I'm going with that is you have these nine commandments. We're all going to say, 
yeah, you gotta, uh, you gotta only worship God and you gotta not covet and you, uh, and you gotta not kill. That's bad. Right. So we have all of these that like we can precisely fit into moral. And then we have Sabbath. It's kind of civil, kind of this different animal. Like what do you make of God, including Sabbath in the 10 words? Yeah. Well, in the book, I, I just uh, I, I kind of punted on all the particular <laughs> debates about Sabbath keeping and uh, tried, tried to give a, a very generic um, summary of what I, I think what I think the church has done. And that has been uh, to say that the, the Sabbath is certainly fulfilled in Jesus. Paul says that. And yet the church has generally seen uh, a, an ongoing value in a practice in, in some kind of practical application of uh, rest and you know, pretty soon after Christianity gets established within the Roman Empire in the fourth century, uh, this Sunday is is a is a day of rest. Uh, Constantine establishes Sunday as a day of rest, and I think that's appropriate that uh, there would be that because uh, part of part of the goal of this part of the goal of the commandment is to give relief to people who need relief to workers, uh, and unless you have some kind of general cultural uh, custom of doing that. Whether it's established by law or not, unless unless there's some kind of uh, norm of of uh, leisure or at least uh, not leisure really, but rest, then it, it's not going to be done. But I think the this is this is one of the commandments where I think the set the Christological dimension is really valuable. Um, well, two things I would say. One is that um, we need to attend to the whole of the fourth uh, of the the fourth word, the uh, uh, the Sabbath command. Because we, we tend to think of the Sabbath command as thou shalt you, thou shalt work six days and the seventh day you shall rest. Mm-hmm. But then you've got a couple more verses after that that list all the people that are supposed to be given rest by people who have authority over them. So the Sabbath the Sabbath command is not just about taking a day off for yourself. It's about granting relief to those who are under you including animals. Animals are supposed to get a Sabbath day too. Um, so th- once you start thinking about it that way, then you can see that it expands into kind of a, an entire vision of society where our uh, our vision of society is not, it's not certainly not a kind of 24 seven workaholic society. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not, a, it's not a society where the leisure class is able to take rest and everybody else has to work to keep them going. It's, it's a society where there's a kind of, um, there's a generosity in giving rest. There's a generosity in giving relief. Now, this is why I think the Sabbath becomes a symbol of uh, what Israel is supposed to be as a people. Uh, Isaiah 58 talk, uses Sabbath keeping and fasting as a way of talking about what Israel is called to do. Mm-hmm. And what they're called to do is to the fast that they're called to the true Sabbath keeping they're called to is to clothe the naked and to feed the hungry and to give shelter to, to the homeless. Those are all aspects of the Sabbath command. Because they're all about giving relief to those who are distressed. Mm, I love that. The other, the other aspect of it is that once you start thinking about the Sabbath command in the light of that, the second half of the commandment, you realize that Jesus never once breaks or even finds an exception to the Sabbath command. Everything Jesus does is strictly uh, obedient to the Sabbath command. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's giving rest on the Sabbath day, which is what the Sabbath day is for. So this, he's violating Pharisaical customs about the Sabbath. But he's actually he's the only Sabbath keeper around. It seems right. uh, he's the only one who's doing it the way it's uh, it was uh, set out in the law, uh, because it's all about giving rest and not simply taking rest. That's good. Hey, we've got an audience member. We like to take audience questions. Uh, BJ Allen, a regular viewer of of ours, wants to know: Are the Ten Commandments some kind of special law uh, that's kind of like higher than Torah or? I can't read from this distance. Uh, aren't they just Torah like the rest different. of it? Yeah. yeah, something different, something like Torah like the, the rest of it. Sorry, I've got a screen behind this camera that's like another three feet away, and uh, I'm getting old, so it's, it's not working so good. <laughs> so what, old, dude. What, You're what ancient. say you? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, again, of kind rights. of a both and. <laughs> uh, both and, but I would uh, let me let me clarify what what the both and the and are. Um, in a sense, they're just it's just another collection of God's words to Israel, um, bearing the same authority as everything else, and everything else bears the same authority as the Ten Words. But there are a couple of things that make it unique. Uh, one is the fact that this these are the only words that are uh, spoken directly by God to Israel. Uh, 
you know, immediately after the 10 words are delivered, the people get frightened and they ask Moses to make sure that God stops speaking to them directly. Mm -hmm. And they ask Moses to be the mediator. You, you go up and listen to him. It's scaring us to death. We don't want to have to listen to his voice. And then you, you tell us what he said. So there's that itself highlights the 10 words as, as uh, having a unique status. And then if you start looking at the rest of the Torah, you realize that there's a, the, the, the 10 words are frequently structuring the way that the Torah is organized elsewhere. I mean, there's there are a lot of commentators in Deuteronomy that point out the Deuteronomy is basically following the Decalogue uh -huh. uh, in its in its or in its outline. Uh, it's expanding on um, uh, each of the ten words, so it's got several chapters on Sabbath keeping, for example, rather than just one a, a couple of sentences. Uh, but it's organized by the same set of ten words, so that that suggests that there's it's kind of the it's kind of the uh, undergirding, it's kind of the skeleton of the law. And it does, and even in the ten, in, in the in the New Testament, you have passages, moral passages that are structured in uh, patterns of ten. So there's a, um, I think it does have a kind of uniqueness within the law. Hmm. Okay. Now, when we get to the New Testament, we see some interesting wording when law is talked about. Uh, for instance, uh, I think of Galatians six two, where it talks about the law of Christ. Romans 8, I believe it's verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which has set us free. Uh, James mm -hmm. chapter 1, there's the law of liberty. Uh, which, should we understand this as though like Jesus came and he established his new and better law? Uh, and, or should we understand this as, uh, as maybe, uh, hey, this is a reference to the uh, kind of like that Second Corinthians chapter three, where the law is written on our hearts and not on tablets mm -hmm. of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And so it, it, it's the same law, but now internalized and there's a freedom in that. I, I mean, I know there's different ways uh, and it comes back a little bit to that continuity, continuity, discontinuity thing we've touched on. But how should we understand these statements in the New Testament that seem to uh, to characterize the law? Uh, in connection with Christ, with liberty and, and the law that sets us free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that the, the uh, Galatians passage is particularly striking because uh, most of Galatians, of course, is um, a, a polemic against the Judaizers who want to bring Gentiles under mm -hmm. the uh, under the uh, yoke of the Torah again. Um, and then Paul, so after after several chapters of polemicizing against Judaizers, then Paul starts using uh, the, the terminology of the Torah, not just at, at the beginning of chapter six, but in other places too. And he starts using the word uh, terminology of works uh, in a positive way, uh, faith working through love. So it's the same root uh, in the Greek. After, he's, after he seems to be uh, criticizing those who rely on works, suddenly he's talking about works. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a rhetorical play going on there. And I, I do think it, it goes back to things I was saying. The way I would summarize it is similar to what I said earlier, that there's a, uh, there's a, we're no longer under the Torah as a system. Uh, yeah, the spirit has come. The spirit writes the law on, on the tablets of our hearts, not on tablets of stone. So there's, there is a kind of internalization of the law by the spirit. Uh, but at the same time, we need the external word of God to be correcting us and speaking to us. I mean, the, the, the practical dilemma always is, uh, what, how do I know the difference between the promptings of the spirit and my own desires? If mm -hmm. I'm just relying on what's inside me, right. uh, I need a word from outside. Uh, and uh, so we continue to have external words, including, including the old Testament, but again, the old Testament interpreted and understood through the teaching and example of Jesus. Uh, but that, that word has to speak to us in order to correct us. And, uh, you know, our hearts are formed by the external word as well as by the internal working of the spirit. Okay. And uh, if you were, let me ask you this. So I want to touch on that second Corinthians three, a little bit more where it talks about, Hey, it's not written on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. If you were to try to explain this to a 10 year old, here's what it means that the law of God is written on the heart of a believer. What would you say to that person? Hmm. Um, what what age? <laughs> uh, call it thirteen. Okay. Oh, thirteen. Okay. So one of my grandkids. Um, yeah, th that's a that's a uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure that I have a I have a, a pre uh, 
a prepackaged answer to that. I'll, I'll I'll speak to it, but I don't think I, I have a good prepackaged answer. Fifteen. No, I'm just sixteen. <laughs> no, no, let me finish. Seventeen. Thirty-nine. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get. I guess I would say. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm just repeating what I said before that um, there uh, the gift of the Spirit. The Spirit has come. The Spirit lives in you. I would say to the 15 year old or the 10 year old or the five year old, the spirit lives in you. And because the spirit lives in you, Jesus lives in you. So Jesus and his spirit are working within you to conform you to the image of Christ. And he's giving you a desire to keep the law. He's, um, he's giving you a, uh, uh, a, uh, um, a kind of an impulse to keep his commandments and to walk faithfully with him. Um, you need to keep listening to the word, but uh, he's he's done something in you that uh, is a is a gift of the new covenant that he hit, didn't do in the old covenant. Amen. I, yeah, as I said, I don't I don't think I have a nifty prepackaged answer to that. I have to think more about that. <laughs> hey, Notori, yeah, no, Notori, that's good. That's uh, good. That, that'll be for part two when you come back. Uh, that's our way okay. of uh, getting guests to <laughs> we, come we, back on the we show. We manipulate them live on the yeah, show. Yeah, we say, hey, you couldn't answer the question. Sure. You've got to no, eventually. But I actually like that answer. It's no, really so helpful. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, it talks about, it says, Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, uh, which was being brought to an end. It talks about the ministry of death. Uh, should mm. we talk about the, I mean, it talks about in, in stone that's being carved. I'm assuming it's speaking of the Ten Commandments. Can you maybe explain yeah. Why it's calling the Ten Commandments ministry of death? Yeah, well, okay. I think uh, when you at, read at it the, out loud, at, you actually have to say it that way too, yeah, with Josh. A really yeah. ominous voice. <laughs> yeah, but well, I think you just think of the provisions of Torah. You can get some sense practically of what it is. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of killing that goes on uh, when you live under Torah. Uh, every time you every time you go to the sanctuary, you're killing something. Every mm. morning, the priests are killing things. Every evening, they're killing things. Um, there's uh, there are severe penalties for various kinds of crimes. Uh, so there's that dimension of it. I, I think that there's also uh, this is this is coming more from uh, Romans five than from the Second Corinthians passage. But uh, there's a, a I think a, a, the 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 reality of the old covenant is that death is spreading under the old covenant. The old covenant is under the, under the reign of death. Adam sinned uh, and uh, humanity come, came under the, uh, uh, come on, came under the rule of death. And that's symbolized in the Torah in various ways, partly by what I just talked about, the various, various things that involve actual killing. But if you think about the, the purity laws of the Torah, uh, the purity laws of the Torah are all ways I think of symbolizing the way death is spreading in the old covenant. So uh, if you have certain bodily functions make you unclean, uh, uncleanness is a kind of ceremonial death. If you're unclean, you can't go into the presence of God and uh, enjoy communion with God, which is the definition of life. So there's, um, uh, if you're unclean, you're in a, in a state of living death by yourself. And then you can spread if certain forms of uncleanness, you can spread the death that's in you to other people. You're constantly having to go to, uh, you know, go through various rituals of washing and cleansing in order to purify yourself. Uh, it's a reminder that you're under the reign of death. Um, so I think uh, when you, again, I, I would, I would try to explain that in terms of the, uh, the specific provisions of Torah. And there's a, uh, the, w the way that Torah describes uh, and, uh, symbolizes the the reality of uh, uh of death death reigning through sin gotcha so uh, this is one of the things that i learned when we were talking with carmen i didn't even realize this is a thing but you can actually number the commandments in certain ways and that actually yes. helps you understand how you understand the commandments so how do you number the commandments uh do you know what i'm referring to yeah. Uh, you mean are you mean talking about the ten words, or are you talking about all the commandments? The the ten words, uh, and talking about yeah. how how we number There's them. Different ways of counting. Yeah. Uh, like you said in your book, we're still learning oh. how to count to ten. <laughs> so, yeah, it, yeah. How yeah. do you, how do you uh, count right, them? The, the, because it's not yeah. like he says first, second, third. <laughs> right. Yeah. There there are a lot more than ten words. I mean, the, when when the uh, I, I've been using that phrase, and I should explain it. Uh, 
I use the word phrase 10 words rather than 10 commandments. Uh, that's actually the phrase that's used in the Old Testament to describe the Decalogue. Uh, mm-hmm. And the word Decalogue means 10 words, not 10 commandments. Um, and I think that's a good, it's a good discipline because it reminds you that there are things mm-hmm. other than commandments in, in the Decalogue. Uh, there are promises. Uh, there are, you know, God begins the first word by talking about how he delivered Israel from Egypt. So there's a, there's a kind of historical, um, there's a historical background of God's relationship to Israel. Uh, there are threats within the ten words, so mm-hmm. it's not all just it's not just a series of uh, of uh, of commandments. So uh, yeah, there are different ways of doing that. The way that I argued for in the book was, uh, I think that the literarily the ten words divide pretty pretty neatly into five and five into 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 half, mm-hmm. uh, and you can see that in a couple of different ways. If you just just at a glance at Exodus twenty, where the ten commandments are first given, the ten words are first given. You can see that the first five words are much longer than the second. So I'm talking about from uh, "Thou shalt have no other gods before me" to "Honor your father and your mother." Uh-huh. Uh, those are the first, those are the first five, and they're considerably longer than the second five. Uh, there's like um, six or seven times as many words in the Hebrew in the first huh. five as there are in the second five, uh, and all of them include some kind of explanation or justification, some kind of warning or promise that's attached to the commandment to encourage obedience when you get to number six seven and eight in the hebrew they're just two words each not kill kill, (laughs) not steal not adulterate Uh, then a a few more words in the last two commandments but they're much shorter the other thing that's distinctive about the first five commandments is that each of them names yahweh uh, the name of the lord Uh, and then yahweh's name is not mentioned at all in the second half of the decalogue so I think in, just in a um, looking at the literary form of the commandments, you can see that they they fall out into this five plus five mm-hmm. pattern. And then in the in the book, I try to connect that five plus five to other to other five plus five structures in in the, the temple and elsewhere in the Old Testament. Okay, you you want to expand on that for us a little bit and share some of those five plus five structures because you yeah. uh, you see some significance in that. Yeah, sure. Uh, what it. Think, think about the 10 words. The, the ultimate place that the 10 words are deposited is inside the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, this box, at least the lower part of the Ark of the Covenant, is a box. And then there's a, a, a cover and, a, and the Lord's throne above that. Uh, so the 10 commandments are within that, and they're deposited within the most holy place of the temple, so in the inner sanctuary. Uh, in Solomon's temple, there are other... So in, within the inner sanctuary, I have this 5 plus 5 commandments. Uh-huh. Uh, when you when you go out to the next part of the temple to the to the holy place of the temple, there are five, there are ten uh, lampstands that are arranged in a five plus five pattern, five on either side of the temple. Uh, there are ten tables, again arranged in five plus five on either side of the in either side of the uh, holy place. When you go out into the courtyard, there are um, basins of water that are set up on these structures that look like chariots. And there are ten of those, and they're divided into five plus five. So uh, you have all those all those structures within the temple that match the five plus five character of the commandments. Crazy. And I think those are different ways of symbolizing what the commandments are supposed to be, and how they're supposed to be used. So you have five plus five, five commandments, five plus five lampstands, because uh, Torah is a light. Amen. Five plus five commandments, and you've got five plus five tables because Torah is our bread; it's our food. Uh, you got the ten words in the inner sanctuary, and then you got the ten water chariots on the out uh, on that courtyard. Uh, this is the Torah that's supposed to be carried out like living water to the nations. That's the picture that you have with these water water chariots. Uh, it's like water flowing from the the uh, temple out to the nations to refresh them and to give them life. Um, and what's t- what's flowing out is the word of the Lord. Uh, that's the vision of Isaiah, for example. The word of the Lord flows out to the nations. They beat their swords and postures. And all that's symbolized in the way that the temple is constructed with the five plus five commandments in the inner sanctuary and then these other five plus five structures symbolizing the, the intention and the purpose of the commandments. That, that's beautiful. And I definitely like in my Bible reading plans, when I get to tabernacle designs, I might read a little faster sometimes. Um, so <laughs> you, need, you need to slow down, slow down. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so talk to us about what, what do you think is the reason why there's, uh, so Yahweh's name is mentioned 
in all of the first five commandments, but not the second five. There's a lot more explanation in the first five, but not the second five. Could you talk to us about why you believe they're structured this way? Yeah, uh, the uh, I, I think that it's related to, this is a, a pretty traditional way of uh, summarizing the 10 words to say that they're, they're um, addressing or, or they're elaborations of Jesus' two great commandments. Um, shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the first five commandments are dealing with uh, a love of Yahweh, love of the Lord. And I think that includes, I, I do think that includes the fifth commandment, which has to do with honoring parents, because the, uh, um, that includes the Lord's name, and honoring parents uh, is a way of showing respect and honor to the authorities that the Lord has set over us. Huh. Those unchosen authorities that that we that we did, you know, there, there's no there's no social contract for families. Uh, it's not like the kids get together and decide who's going to be the parents. Right. If I were to, to just to give pushback on that, wouldn't you say yeah. all of the commandments honor God then, and then obeying those commandments, they all honor God? Why would that sure. fifth one be considered? Uh, the God half of the the Ten Commandments. Yeah, well, I'm putting that in the first half because of the because of the structure and the name the use of the name Yahweh. So I'm, okay, gotcha. I think that literarily it's it, it's associated liter, literarily with the first half of the Decalogue, hmm. and then I'm uh, trying to think about why that would be. Why would you take a commandment that has to do with respect and honor to human beings and classify that with uh, with commandments that have to do with uh, directly with honoring and worshiping God? So it's it's the literary argument is in the background. Yeah. So then the, the second half of the, the second half of the Decalogue um, is dealing with human interhuman relationships, you know, killing, stealing, adultery. Um, the ninth word is one of the I think the ninth word is one of the examples of uh, 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 in the ten words where you have something that's more than just private and personal ethics or moral law. Uh, it has to do with law courts. Uh, thou shalt not, not bear false witness. We should take witness there as a witness at law. Uh -huh. um, but that has to do with damaging your neighbor. You don't uh, you don't go to court and bear false witness in court in order to uh, in order to damage your neighbor's reputation or his property or take away his life. Um, you don't do that out, out of court either. But the specific situation in the ninth word is uh, is courtroom. So the second half of the decalogue has to do with. Uh, interhuman relations, and I think that that would that would be related to the literary structure that I was describing. So the, the division between uh, commandments that have to do with love of God and commandments that have to do with love of neighbor. Yeah, I, I love that. You start with the literary instead of just like how can we categorize these. You start with the literary structure so you can get to the author's intent, and then I think there's there's got to be some kind of beautiful meditational sort of understanding that we can draw from the fact that whereas we would probably naturally put honor your mother and father more in the love your neighbor camp than the love God camp, that there's some way hmm. in which this is very directly loving God, submitting to yeah. and honoring uh, parents. And I love, I know, uh, I love in your book too, you talk about this is really more than just honoring your literal mother and father, but it, it speaks to all authority figures. And so I can kind of see how in that it's it's such a direct expression of one's honor for God and why it might be included in that in that first yeah. uh, that first five. I, it, I'd like to actually, yeah, I think, oh, yeah, when I elaborate on yeah, when I elaborate on the fifth word, just to reinforce that point, when I elaborate on the fifth word, I focus some attention on the the term that's used for honor, which is uh, the Hebrew verb kavod, uh, the same word that's used for glor to glorify God. Uh -huh. um, it's it's usually a, a word that's used for worship. Hmm. worship of God. Yeah. But in, in relation to parents, um, uh, that's the, that's the word that's used. And then I, I try to think through, what does that mean? You know, what does it mean to, to glorify God? You, you listen to him, you speak, you speak praise of him. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, serve him and, and, uh, all, all of those things are, uh, aspects of, uh, glorifying, uh, authorities and particularly parents. Yeah. Uh, one question I have on the specific uh, commandment of honoring your father, father and mother is, you know, Paul comments in Ephesians chapter six, it's the first command with a promise. Mm -hmm. You'll live long in the land. And I've struggled to explain that to my kids because 
if it's proverbial, I totally get it. People who honor their parents are not rebellious individuals and typically live longer, right? But, um, but Jesus dies at 33, and he was perfect at honoring his father and mother. That word promise really gets me. I'm kind of like, Lord, I, I get it as a proverb, but not a promise. So how would you, how, how would you explain it to a 12-year-old? I'm just kidding. No, how would you explain it to a 39-year-old? He's trying to get family counseling for these guys. You keep pulling this 12-year-old out of your back pocket. Um, <laughs> How would you explain it to a toddler? He's got 12-year-olds at home. That's, that's <laughs> right. why he's asking yes. about this 12-year-old. Uh, um, I, and that's a that's a great point. And again, I don't I don't have a I don't have a, a prepackaged answer to that because that uh, Jesus obviously is the is the perfect Son mm-hmm. who is obeying his heavenly Father and also uh, glorifying and honoring his uh, his. Uh, uh, his his mother and father, his earthly mother and father. A couple of things I would say. I, I think that uh, maybe you're overreading promise. I don't think to say that God has promised something of that sort means that in uh, that there are no there are no exceptions or variations in that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would uh, maybe maybe promise has more of a, perbor- a proverbial force than you're suggesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. I guess that maybe another maybe another dimension of it would be. Um, uh, just uh, uh, recognizing that all of the ten words are transformed by Jesus' obedience, and our understanding of how they work and what we're supposed to do is transformed by Jesus' experience and obedience and teaching. So, um, I mean, Jesus, Jesus, uh, uh, just uh, on on that commandment, Jesus has some pretty harsh things to say about families. Uh, a lot of what he says about families is pretty harsh. Uh, mm-hmm. You got to hate your father and mother in order to follow me. Uh, let the dead bury their dead. Yeah. Um, you give up. You give up your father and mother. So there's there's something there's something uh, uh, being transformed about the way that commandment is being kept. It's not that it's being canceled out or rendered irrelevant, but in the light of Jesus and in His teaching, something new is happening. And uh, that I think that would be related to it. Although you know, again, I I would need to think more about. Uh, how to put all those pieces together. So uh, in one of the commandments that we have in, in the Ten Commandments is this idea of uh, graven images. How do you understand yeah. the graven images text? Is that speaking of other gods or is that any kind of graven image? Uh, I know that, that many have actually used this to say uh, that any kind of iconography or some people go even further to say any kind of image at all uh, would be uh, somehow uh, an abomination. How, how would we to understand the graven image command? Yeah, uh, I don't think it prohibits all forms of representational art. Uh, that's the way some have taken it. Um, but that would, that doesn't, that would, that's contradicted um a few chapters later in Exodus itself by the Lord himself, uh, who tells Israel to make um, golden cherubim and put them on the ark. Yeah. And uh, weave, weave golden, weave cherubim into the curtains of the tabernacle and make um, make fabric pomegranates that are put at the hem of the uh, priest's robe. That's, that's a representation of something, uh, uh, that's something that's created. Well, the commandment prohibits, if it prohibits representational art, it prohibits representational art of everything. Because the commandment says, thou shalt not make any graven image of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or is that, that is in the water under the earth. So that's that covers everything. That's right. Um, if it's prohibiting representations, then it's prohibiting all representations of everything. But I don't think that's what it's saying. You've got to read both of those clauses together. And what the, the the prohibition is against making images in order to use them as objects, not just objects, but vehicles for worship. So, uh, I mean, the, you think about the ancient world, uh, that was that's how worship was conducted. Um, if you were a priest in a pagan temple in the ancient world, your entire day was occupied with taking care of an image in the inner sanctuary of the temple. You know, in the morning, you would open the doors of the temple. Uh, you would uh, enter with food that you would present to the to the image of the god. Uh, you might uh, decorate the image of the god and take him out on a procession so he can get some sun, I guess. <laughs> take him out for a walk, carrying him up on your shoulders. Uh, you know, he, he gets dusty every now and then. You've got to dust him off. Um, you spend your whole day doing homage. You bow before him. You kiss his feet. You do your whole. You, you're, you're a priest. You spend your whole day uh, serving an image, and that's what Israel 
in the in the particular context, that's what Israel is being prohibited from. Which is good uh, so it, because like our set is safe. You know, I've got my Martin Luther up here. I've got this really know. weird deer head looking Get thing these abominations back here. To, that I, no, you know, no, I won't. John Calvin and Jacob Arminius back there. They're all they're all safe. That's what you're saying. We're, we're yeah, good. yeah. Except I, I, I don't take them on walks. I did. I don't. Do I don't bring them. them food. Occasionally, I dust them, but that's yeah. you know the books too. Yeah, well, I hope I, just, I hope you have Calvin Arminius on different shelves. Just to, you know, actually, it, I don't know if you can see it. Can this see poster this right behind us? Michael is Jacob Arminius and John Calvin fighting. It's this T-shirt actually. Um, oh, it's a box. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I it's, see. it's a theological that's... fight night. So yeah, they yeah. they uh, they are not getting along. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. So I I don't think yeah I don't think anything that uh, those kind of images I don't think are prohibited by the by the second word. I think uh, the, the contemporary application that I make, uh, which is obviously a controversial one, uh, is would be a, about uh, the use of icons uh, by Christian traditions. I mean, the Orthodox tradition makes heavy use of icons. And I think they do the kinds of things that I think that the second word is prohibiting. Uh, they uh, they kiss the icons. They, they uh, burn candles before the icons. They would insist that the icons, they're not worshiping the icons, which is I, I grant that, but they still think that they're having some kind of new contact, some kind of deeper contact with God or with the saint through the icon. And I, I think that's actually exactly the kind of thing that the second word is prohibiting. Dang. I wasn't expecting that answer, but <laughs> I do like it. <laughs> Anyone who watches he, the show he likes it. Well, knows I like we, it. <laughs> uh, we do have some Eastern Orthodox who uh, who listen to us, but yeah. um, yeah. and very close Anglican more. friends that we we talk to, <laughs> yeah, weekly at least. Yeah. <laughs> but honestly, the uh, what the show's Anglican about, Catholic. we want to have open, honest conversation. That's right, uh, and also about hard subjects. So um, yeah. anyway, so I I want to uh, zero in on this specific commandment because if you uh, you know as we're on the first table of the Decalogue. Uh, it's the longer explanations, and it's in this context of graven images where he says, you know, I'll visit the sins of the children down mm. to the third and the fourth generation. Josh and I did a show a few weeks ago about generational curses, and uh, mm. and we just sort of talked through it. But I'd love to hear uh, your perspective. Does Exodus 20 verses 3 and 4, I think it is, teach generational curses? Or if not, what is it teaching? Yeah, uh, well, I think it is, uh, and let me elaborate a little bit on what uh, what how that works itself out in Scripture. The uh, I think the the leading example of a, of a violation within the Bible uh, is the um, the high places that Israel sets up once they get into the land. Um, for example, when when the Northern Kingdom breaks off from the House of David, they set up they set up great uh, they set up golden calves at Two different locations at the southern edge of the of the land, at uh, Bethel, and at the northern boundary at Dan, and that becomes those become the main shrines of uh, Israel's worship. Uh, they're claiming Jeroboam, who who sets up those shrines and those uh, those uh, graven images, he claims that he's just worshiping the God of the Exodus. This is the God who led you out of Egypt. He doesn't claim to be worshiping a different God. He's worshiping mm -hmm. the same God of Israel, but he's using the images to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I think that's the big violation. What, what's interesting goes on in the, it's particularly clear in the book of Kings. Uh, what goes on there is that you have um, uh, dynasties, one dynasty after another in the Northern Kingdom. You have the continuous Davidic dynasty with one slight interruption in the Southern Kingdom. But in the Northern Kingdom, you have, uh, you have, uh, repeated dynasties or, or um, interrupted dynasties that last three or four generations, hmm. interestingly. Yeah. So you have uh, Jeroboam's, Jeroboam's dynasty lasts only a couple of generations, and then you get the dynasty of Omri, and that lasts about four generations. And then you get another dynasty that comes, and that lasts about four generations. So God is cutting off the idolaters within the northern kingdom after three or four generations. So when you look, about it, look at it from that angle— then there's a sense in which there's a there's a blessing because God doesn't allow the cur doesn't allow this practice to continue past the third or fourth generation. He's going to cut it off before then. Um, having said that, I do, I do think that the second word implies uh, intergenerational curses that there there are traditions that are passed on corrupted idolatrous traditions that are passed on 
Uh, I mean, Ezekiel makes it clear that if you have an idolatrous father or a wicked father followed by a faithful, God-fearing son, the son and uh, the son abandons his father's uh, his father's uh, way his father's ways. He hates his father in in the sense I think Jesus means it, uh, and and follows the Lord instead. Then he'll be saved. So uh, the the assumption of the third and fourth generation, I think, is that you have this tradition passed on. And to three and four generations, you have people persisting in that corrupted tradition. And so the curse keeps keeps going down through the generations. But I think there's a, there's an element of mercy to it because I think it it's, means that the Lord is let's let only lets it go so long. He doesn't he mm-hmm. doesn't let it go for a thousand generations. Right. The blessing goes for a thousand generations, but the curse is the cursed uh, generations are cut out cut off sooner. So how are we to understand that as as Christians? Can't like, or even I said, Old Testament covenant. I think would be would be even uh, easier for the context that we're talking about. And these are individuals who are under the blessing in the, that that they're of Israel, but they're also under a curse simultaneously. Uh, I guess do believers or can believers be cursed? Uh, how, how how exactly does that all work out? Yeah, well, there's a uh, yeah, there's a there's a kind of dub, uh, double double layer that you have to look at. Uh, there, uh, you know. Think about Jeroboam. He's he's the he's the one who does the great sin in the northern kingdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, is is he within the uh, covenant with Abraham? Is he operating within uh, within the Israelite covenant? Well, in a sense, he is. Yes, because he's uh, he's. Um, I mean, he would be circumcised. His sons would be circumcised. They would be keeping certain certain dimensions of Torah. They would be identifying with the God of Israel. Uh, but at the same time, they're breaking the commandments, a central commandment. So, and I think that you know the uh, uh, the covenant the covenant comes with both promises promises of blessing, but also threats of curse. I mean, that's part of the covenant arrangement. And so, uh, being in covenant has that dual possibility. It is a blessed state to be in covenant, and yet there is the uh, there is the threat always that if you turn from the Lord, then uh, those curses will come on you. So, I, I think you do have to look at it in those in that complex way to get the full picture. Hmm. So in a in a new covenant context, um, do you believe that this is still in play? So that a believer blessed by the Lord could, in a sense, be cursed on account of what Grandpa did. Well, again, I would I would bring up Ezekiel. I think the assumption of the commandment is that you have uh, not just a curse passed on, but the practices that deserve the curse passed on. Mm-hmm. So part of the curse is that God doesn't stop people. And call them to repentance in the in the second generation. That's part of the curse that he gives them over to uh, their over to their idolatry. Right. So, uh, I mean, from Ezekiel, I think it's clear that uh, you don't have somebody who is faithful, who's uh, striving to to uh, to serve God, who's worshiping Him faithfully, and is under a curse because of his granddad. That's right. not that's not what you have. You have people who are are following in the traditions of their uh, of their fathers, uh, who are under the curse, uh, and they you know they may be under the curse while still being within uh, within the body of Christ within the church, mm-hmm. uh, and so you know they might be under curse and be uh, named as Christians, but uh, they're they're under curse because they're continuing in the evils that their forefathers did. Okay. So, so there's, in your mind, there's not a scenario where it's like your granddad did this. So you're getting punished with that. You would say it's more like the sin runs in the family. And if you don't repent of granddad's sin, that's been passed down to you, then you inherit, you've inherited his sin and his, you, you've adopted his sin and therefore inherited his curse and also. I think an important question to add is when you say repent of his sin, you mean repent of that family yeah, yeah, sin, yeah. not like. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Great yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I add another wrinkle to it because I, I do think that there's another complexity. Um, I mean, um, so granddad um, uh, was a drunk and uh, an adulterer. Um, uh, does that, does that mean that his son and his grandson are going to be cursed by his sin? Well, you could say, uh, if they repent, no. On the other hand, are they going to be dealing with the damage of granddad's life? Does that continue for generations? And and it absolutely does. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, Adam sinned. 
he was cast out of Eden. Uh, Cain and Abel were born, and they were also outside of Eden. They didn't get a fresh start in in Eden. So the, the very fact that something has happened in the past means that there's a there's a kind of fixity to it. They're not they're not determined. Uh, the, the later generations are not determined to follow that same pathway, but there's still damage that goes with that that needs to be part of the repentance would be to try to undo the damage. I think we have enough time for maybe one more question. I'm curious how you understand taking the Lord's name in vain. Uh, I know there's uh, the common teaching I had in Sunday school is if I stub my toe and scream an expletive, then uh, I have taken the Lord's name in vain. Or, Not that we should you, dishonor God's name. But or if you I, use the Lord's name as your expletive. As my expletive. Yes, yes, I, I, that's right. Um, uh, how exactly would you understand that text? And those watching, you, you shouldn't use God's name. In a, in a curse sort of way, uh, right. uh, just as, as a default. I'm not justifying it. I'm just curious. Is, is there another interpretation present? Yeah. Well, I think the, the verb the verb that's used in that commandment is not. Uh, doesn't, it's not really. It's not speak. So it's not talking about words. Mm. Uh, at least that's not the that's not the the focus. The, the The verb means something more like bear or carry. Um, and I think the the premise the the premise in the background is that Israel. Uh, is marked with God's name. They're marked with the covenant. They are already bearing God's name. And if if they sin in any way, I mean, the, there are places in the in the places in the Old Testament where uh, people who who uh, steal are described as as uh, bearing God's name lightly, which is the the command the uh, violation of the third commandment. Uh, I think when Jesus condemns the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, he's condemning people who are bearing God's name lightly. They uh, take God's name. They are Jews. They say we are the people of God. Uh, they talk about God all the time, but they don't take God seriously. Uh, they treat it as kind of an empty syllable. Uh, you know, Yahweh is just a couple of empty syllables, uh, and his word is just empty syllables. They don't actually take it with the weight it deserves. So in, in that sense, any sin can be a violation of that commandment. And I think particularly uh, what's what's it, what's the focus, the focus of the third word is uh, what I would call practical idolatry. Uh, it's uh, living in a way as if God does not exist. You're not worshiping other gods. You're not using graven images, but you're living in a way as if God didn't exist. You, you wear his name because you were baptized into his name, but that, that name doesn't, uh, doesn't have any weight for you. Um, that that would include the way we speak, obviously, but it doesn't just include the way we speak. It includes the way we behave generally. That's great. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, this was a, a great interview, really encouraged by your discussion today with us. Uh, we typically close up the show with something we call closing thoughts. I'll toss it over to Michael. I'll toss it over to you. That one little nugget uh, that you want people to walk away with is kind of that, that impactful thought as they think about the Ten Commandments going forward. Uh, I'll start with Michael, and then we'll, we'll have you give your thoughts, and we'll wrap up the show. Okay, absolutely. Uh, I think for me is what you said about not oversimplifying Torah, not oversimplifying the Ten Commandments and what they are. Uh, whereas we, we look at a Romans 3.20, and it's like, hey, this is to show you how sinful you are. And it's definitely that, but when but it's also more than that. And you and using the symbolism of the tabernacle, you walked through how Torah is our food and it is our light and specifically the 10, the 10 words uh, and, and they're our guide. And ultimately they point us to Jesus who kept these commandments perfectly. And so I think having a holistic understanding of the 10 words would be my, my greatest takeaway because ultimately they point us to Jesus. Yeah, doc, Dr. Lightheart, your thoughts here. Yeah, yeah, the last point you were making, Michael, is what I would want uh, as the takeaway, that uh, uh, I think if you want to get to the depth of the 10 words, what you need to do is try to think through the ways that Jesus kept these commandments and the way that the 10 words are a character description of Jesus. Jesus is the one who worships God and God alone. He's the one who honors the image of God in even the most broken and lowly of human beings. Uh, he is the one who gives rest. He keeps Sabbath. He doesn't kill. He goes to his death. He doesn't steal. He pays back our debt, a debt he doesn't owe. He's faithful to his bride. He bears true witness. Uh, if you think through, um, meditate on the commandments as uh, depictions and descriptions of Jesus. And I think that not only gives you a, a rounded picture of Jesus, but it, it shows us what we're supposed to do because we're supposed to be followers of Jesus. 
we're supposed to become like him. Uh, mm-hmm. And the 10 words give us uh, insight in what that, into what that means. That's good. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was an honor to have you with us. Uh, for those of you who are watching right now, I would encourage you to go ahead and hit the subscribe button, like the video so that we can help uh, get popular within the YouTube algorithms. <laughs> so that uh, we can be popular. We, we can be popular so people can see the content. So that <laughs> God can be glorified. Because God can be glorified, guys. That's <laughs> that's what I said. If you heard anything else, you weren't listening. Um, Is it, it's all these graven images it's all the that graven are distracting images. They've, you. They've, they've, they've pulled my heart away. Okay, so here's the thing, guys. <laughs> Uh, so subscribe, hit the like button. We've got a lot of content coming out just in a couple hours uh, at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Dr. Sam Storms is coming on the show. And then soon following after him, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Dr. Ben Witherington the the third. third. Uh, I was going to get the third in there. Uh, and then next week, Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, we have the the premier Trinitarian theologian talking about something other than the Trinity. We're talking about the four truths of Pentecost with Dr. Peter, uh, not not Peter Lightheart, that's who I have on the phone, Robert Letham coming on the show. So really, really great stuff uh, that I would encourage you guys to hit that subscribe button so you see all the content we're coming out with in the next couple of days, actually. So uh, looking forward to it. We'll see you guys next time. Peace. Thanks, guys.